Oh. So, can you clarify about that? Like 640. Yeah. Oh. Six to 640. Oh, like, six to 640. Okay. I was like, um. Thought it was yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so this. Like, this stresses me out. Because I'm stressed about 40. <laughs> um.
I'm starting. I'm starting the video. So, Just so you know. Okay. What do you hit from time? So you can put the folder in the back. Okay. So where do you think? Yeah. So now you can see what what everyone else can see. Yeah, hey guys. Ready. Yep. Yeah. So, and you can move that uh, mat too if you need it. Um, hey Doris. Hello. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? How are you? Oh. Do you guys want your cells on big here? Or or like that? Either way, I feel like it's close enough. Yeah, because there's more for you. You can see that. Yeah. So Yeah, there you go. You need to make this bigger or be good. Yeah, you could make it. Um, can you guys see this? Yeah. Yeah. just looks like Do we have one more? Um, should we start? Who else said they were coming? No, I think that's it. I think that's okay. it. Yep. Okay. Hi, guys. Thank you for coming. We're just going to take one more minute to get st like set up. Okay. <laughs> this is so weird. It's weird. I, we talk all day long. But Jamie, you guys are stuff. used to this, but we're trying. Oh, the Facebook stuff? Just like the oh, Zoom situation. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. And then. So, Oh, that is funny, isn't it? We might have to jump to the side of this. Maybe? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Oh, that's funny. Okay. 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 I feel like I'm more. Yeah. Okay. You're wrong. Ready? Yep. All right. So you're talking here too. Oh, yep. goodness. Yep. Okay. Yep. We got lots of banter. Awesome. I'm not. Okay. I'll leave it on. Yeah, you yeah. can take it off if you want to. I mean, that's too bad. Yeah. Um, we'll see. Can okay. you guys hear us okay with our masks on, or does that make it difficult to hear? I can hear you fine. Uh, so I'm Erica Johnson, and this is Lisa McDonald. We're both physical therapists at Platinum Physical Therapy um, in Hopkinton, and and are kind of back and forth right now between the Lumber Street office as well as the Resilience location. Uh, and we want to talk to you a little bit about what pelvic floor physical therapy is and how it can be beneficial for people throughout their life. Um, and one of the other things I wanted to put out there is to let you know that we are happy to take questions during the presentation, but we'll also take time at the end. So if at any point you have questions or things that happen to come up um, that you're thinking about, there's a good chance that somebody else has the same question. So feel free to kind of raise your hand or interject however makes sense for you. Sound good? Okay. Uh, and then also let us know if this is hard to see. We can adjust the, the screen over time as well. Uh, so there's a whole range of who can benefit from pelvic health physical therapy. Um, and, and children are a, a bracket of the population that tends to go overlooked. And, um, and part of what we treat in kiddos more often than not is uh, the, the potty training years and then constipation and bedwetting and, and daily incontinence. And some of that is normal in the toddler years, obviously, with potty training. Uh, but a lot of parents struggle with it, and we really feel like there's a lot of help that we can provide to prevent there being chronic issues. The interesting thing is that we often will treat adults that have a long history of incontinence or bedwetting or constipation that was happening during childhood years and it was never addressed. Um, and so we're hoping to really kind of break some of those patterns as time goes on. 
Um, and then the other interesting thing to realize is that men and women also struggle with pelvic floor dysfunction um, on varying levels. Uh, and both of them are often undertreated and underdiagnosed. But in women, 25 to 76% of women experience some level of involuntary leakage of urine um, at some point during their life. 15% have pain with sexual intercourse and 20% are constipated. Uh, I strongly suspect that the constipation percentage is actually really underreported. Um, we find that as we ask more pointed questions that people start to answer yes to things. So if a physician were to ask people, you know, are you constipated? Most people would say no, but if you truly define what constipation is, we start to find that those answers change quite a bit. Um, and then the other thing to realize is that men also have pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, most commonly, we see men with either pelvic pain, uh, and that really runs the gamut. I've treated uh, teenage male patients. Uh, usually, you don't see them until like 18, but some of them have reported pelvic pain dating back to early teenage years. Um, and then we often see urinary incontinence and, and pelvic pain um, and erectile dysfunction after a radical prostatectomy. Um, so as physical therapists, we treat kind of the gamut in terms of diagnoses. So we treat stress urinary incontinence, which is leaking of urine with coughing and sneezing or with jumping. Um, and we often hear people in the exercise world um, talking a lot about this, different athletes. And then um, the kind of the rest of us that are normal Joes that aren't high-end athletes that are you know, trying to keep up with our kids or our grandchildren and trying to do you know, jumping jacks or a lot of parents and grandparents will say, oh, you know, like I jumped on the trampoline with my, my grandchildren or I was trying to run across the parking lot to catch my kid and I was having incontinence with that. These are things that happen as we age, but they're not normal side effects of aging. And that's an important thing to realize that we can help with that. Um, urge urinary incontinence is when people have a really strong urge to avoid urine um, and are rushing to get to the bathroom and they're leaking along the way. We often will hear people say that there are triggers that are associated with this. Like it happens when they're putting the key in the door to get home or as they're pulling into the driveway um, maybe turning on the water to wash their hands after eating, those sorts of things. Um, fecal incontinence is another diagnosis that we often treat, and that's leaking of stool uh, involuntarily. Um, constipation, uh, which um, can be a, a wide range of just hard stool on a daily basis, and even though you're passing stool on a daily basis, if it's hard bumps of stool, that's abnormal. Um, and it can also be going days and days or weeks on end without having bowel movement. And sometimes that can oscillate for people over time if they're traveling. Um, pelvic organ prolapse is common after having children, but it's also common with poor mechanics over time. And so that's when people are starting to feel kind of pressure and bulging in the vaginal area, either from um, the bladder or the uterus or the rectum starting to um, move out of the vaginal canal. Um, uh, and, and most people really kind of describe it as having uh, vaginal pressure, but some people will also have pelvic pain, and that is actually the symptom that they're experiencing with that. Um, vulvodynia, which is pain in the vulva area, or some people think of like the vulva area kind of like the lips of the vagina, um, and, and sometimes that can come on as a chemical response. So. We've had lots of patients who have experienced vulvodynia after using a medication topically and their tissue has responded, um, unfortunately, uh, with like burning and, and pain and then it won't dissipate after the medication has been removed. Um, and some people it's more of a nerve irritation that's come on from another injury. Um, vaginismus, which is pelvic floor muscle spasms, um, preventing penetration. Some women experience this um, with their first attempt of sexual intercourse. A lot of women notice it uh, in their early menstruating years when they've tried to use tampons and haven't been able to get them in. Uh, sometimes this happens after some sort of trauma. Um, there's a variety of reasons why people will experience this. Um, scar pain we see a lot of after C-sections, after vaginal deliveries with lacerations, or even after um, abdominal surgeries and after um, 
radical mastectomies. Uh, and then we treat kind of the gamut of pregnancy and postpartum. So we see all kinds of things that happen during pregnancy um, in regard to pelvic pain, shoulder pain, neck pain, back pain. Um, and the interesting thing is that in Europe, uh, postpartum, women are referred to pelvic floor physical therapy as standard care. It's just part of the recovery process. Um, and it would be great to see that change in the US. It just hasn't at this point. Um, but we really encourage women to come in postpartum to work on rehabilitation. Um, bad wetting is something that we address um, and an isthmus, which is uh, spasms of the anal you know, muscles. Um, so a lot of people will say like they have rectal pain or rectal spasms. Sometimes it's associated with sexual intercourse, sometimes it's associated with um, bowel movements, and sometimes it's unpredictable. This particular diagnosis uh, we see with men and with women. Questions so far? That's a lot of information. <laughs> you guys are okay? Yeah. Um, and then there's a whole other string of diagnoses. So some people uh, function fine all day long, but they have pain with bowel movements, and sometimes that can be from um, uh, vaginal delivery scars that have kind of run into the rectal region. Sometimes it has to do with stool consistency. Sometimes it happens after somebody's had a fall and the, the tailbone is displaced and contributes to painful bowel movements. Um, we see patients who have pain with sexual intercourse, which can run the spectrum of life. So kind of like with first attempts um, after having children. And then postmenopausally, when estrogen levels drop, a lot of women will experience pain with intercourse just because of the tissue being less pliable um, and sometimes because of old perineal laceration scars. Um, so from tearing or from episiotomies um, and tissue can help with that. Um, we see a lot of patients with abdominal pain. Uh, that is usually ruled out, like they usually see physicians first to rule out obviously other complications. Um, the abdominal pain is often related to either abdominal adhesions or history of constipation. Um, bladder pain, uh, which sometimes has additional kind of connecting factors in terms of other medical history that patients have had or medications. Um, sometimes people are having painful bladders because of their bladder habits, either not drinking enough water or consuming high levels of foods that can be irritating to the bladder liner and sometimes just some diet modification and some habit changes can be really helpful for that. Some people have vaginal pain that is, is hard to um, kind of diagnose and understand. Um, and so often those patients are being managed by physical therapy as well as other medical practitioners at the same time. Um, rectal pain, uh, and that again can have a variety of reasons as to where that can be coming from. Um, tailbone pain uh, is an interesting thing. I just recently had a case who's had some tailbone pain for years, um, which was connected with burning pain. Um, and she just thought that she had to live with it. She ironically came in to address some bladder symptoms. Um, and we've been able to resolve the tailbone pain, which has indirectly helped her bladder symptoms as well. So they were interconnected, but she didn't realize the connection between the two. Um, and then general pelvic pain. Um, there are some patients that have kind of global pelvic pain internally and externally. So we can work orthopedically to address strength deficits, mechanics to stabilize the pelvis and make sure that it's moving properly and then calm down any of the pelvic floor muscle spasms. Okay. Is this what we were transitioning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and passing off to Lisa. Yeah. Okay, so you've heard uh, Erica Benchin say several mentioned several times the pelvic floor and um, I'm going to just talk to you a couple minutes about what that is and where it is so that you guys kind of get just a very basic understanding of this muscle. This muscle is inside of us. We can't see it. Um, so it's a little bit tricky, but if you look at this, um, this model, it shows that the front of this, this is a side view in the front there's the pubic bone, and then in the back, there's the tailbone. And you can see that this muscle goes 
from the pubic bone all the way to the tailbone. And it looks like a line on this picture, but in 3D, this pelvic floor is actually a bowl. So if you think of a salad bowl or a bowl that you eat your ice cream in, that bowl is sitting at the base of your pelvis. So it's connected to the front of the pubic bone, it's connected to the back to the tailbone, and then it kind of fans out to the sides, to the insides of our hips. Um, so that's where your pelvic floor muscle resides. And um, it has such important job to do. You know, we, we often talk about the core. I'm sure you guys have heard people talk about the core. What does that really mean? So the core, and Erica's gonna describe it as well, but just to give you the basics, um, the very bottom of the core is your pelvic floor, right? In the front of your core is your abdominal wall, and then in the back, you've got your back muscles, and then at the top, we have your diaphragm. And your diaphragm sits kind of at the bottom part of your lungs of the, in, you know, in your rib cage. So that pelvic floor has a huge part of your core, um, huge part. It's so important, it's so overlooked. Um, our pelvic floor has lots of jobs. It has, you know, we talk about that support. Um, if our pelvic floor is weak, oftentimes the bladder, the uterus, or the rectum, one, two, or all three can kind of start to fall down. So our pelvic floor is there to keep everything supported. Our pelvic floor is to, um, also its main job is to support the bladder and to keep that urethra closed as it's filling up and as we're walking around and doing our, our thing. Stability, it provides stability to the whole body and to the core. And then it has sexual function as well, which we'll, we'll go into greater detail in a moment. So this is a picture of that pelvis kind of looking down and in. You can kind of get an idea, the pelvic floor is in red and you can kind of get an idea that it's filling up that that hole that is at the bottom of our pelvis, okay, holding everything up against gravity. And oftentimes we talk about it like a hammock because it truly is, you know, kind of that, that idea. This is the pelvic floor kind of looking like at it, right? So if you were at the gynecologist's office, like this is what they would see. They would see the external part. And you can see at the bottom that these openings go through the pelvic floor, the anus, the vagina, and the urethra. So pelvic floor is such an intimate relationship with your organs. Um, and then this is a slide just kind of detailing. There's a lot of little individual muscles that make up the big pelvic floor. Um, the pelvic floor also has two different types of muscle fiber. We have fast, fast twitch fibers, we have slow twitch fibers. Your fast twitch fibers should contract quickly, fast, when you have a sneeze or a jump or any kind of activity that causes intra-abdominal pressure to pu push downward. When that pressure is pushing downward, like let's say you're, <clears throat> you're coughing, the pelvic floor is supposed to counteract that downward pressure. And if your pelvic floor isn't super strong, that pressure is gonna go down and it's gonna cause some leakage. So our fast twitch fibers, their job is to contract quickly when we need that a little extra support, okay? So when we talk about Kegels, we have to do Kegels for, for di our different muscle fibers. Now the second type of fiber I mentioned to you, the slow, slow twitch, those are your endurance fibers. Those are the ones that kind of start coming into play when you are on your feet all day or you're in line somewhere and your bladder's spilling and it's pretty full and you really got to go. You can't get to the bathroom um, anytime soon or you're, you know, you're in a long, you have a long car ride, your bladder starts filling up. Those pelvic floor muscles are then coming into play a little bit more to keep closure around your urethra. And your bladder is a muscle too. 
So when you sit down to void, your bladder muscle contracts. It's impossible for your bladder to contract and your pelvic floor to contract at the same time. So we, we call on those endurance fibers, the slow twitch fibers, to squeeze, to, to kind of calm that pelvic, to calm the bladder, because they can't squeeze at the same time. So if you start feeling like you're gonna go, you know, squeezing that pelvic floor is really good to kind of calm that bladder down. So it's important when we talk about this muscle, just to also understand that there's little different sections of it, and then there's also different types of fibers in it that are really important. Okay, so why don't we know more about this muscle, guys? Well, we don't talk a lot about it because it doesn't move our joints, so we don't, we can kind of be oblivious to it, right? It's inside of our body. It's in a private part of our, our body that we don't talk about. Um, and so, you know, that's why Erica and I here are like here to really chat with you about it and kind of demystify it all because, you know, we don't hear, we don't get enough accurate information out, out there. Um, so Erica, I'm going to hand it back over to Erica. She's going to talk a little bit more of the function of the pelvic floor. Um, I just want to check in with you guys before I hand it over. You guys still with us? Questions, are you guys good? Okay. Okay. So in terms of the functions of the pelvic floor, the pelvic floor has multiple roles. And one of those is maintaining continence. The other is coordinating elimination of urine and stool, and then it has a supportive function um, for our pelvic organs, and then it creates stability within the pelvis, and it also has a sexual function. So in terms of continence and elimination, the pelvic floor muscles and sphincters wrap around the urethra and the rectal openings to maintain continence and help coordinate elimination. And this is really important because we often see that part of the dysfunction that people are having is based on an incoordination within these muscles and structures. And they've done some interesting research looking at people who have been told to do Kegels to maintain continence or to improve the incontinence that they're experiencing. And 75% of people who are just told to do Kegels are often doing them incorrectly. So they might be pushing when they're supposed to be contracting, um, some people can't even find the muscles. I've had lots of patients who come in and say, I was told to do Kegels and I'm trying to do them, but I really kind of feel like I'm squeezing my inner thighs or I'm squeezing my, my bum on the outside, but I can't really find those muscles to coordinate well. And that's kind of the hallmark of, of what we see with a lot of the, the voiding and the elimination dysfunction is that there's this underlying dysfunction. When we're told as a child to contract our bicep or to bend our elbow, we can understand that because we can see it physiologically happening. When somebody is telling you to contract your pelvic floor, it's an area of the body that none of us have had training in, for the most part, unless we've been to physical therapy. And it's hard to understand how to coordinate those muscles and how to have confirmation that you're doing it properly. Um, you know, if, if I tell you to bend your elbow, you, you know that you're doing it correctly and you know that you're bringing your hand to your shoulder because you can see yourself doing that and I can see you doing that. Uh, another piece of the pelvic floor that's important is its role with stability. And so we hear a lot about core stabilization and we focus a lot on the abdominal wall and the glutes um, and the inner thigh muscles and the back muscles. But what we're missing and, and realizing is that the pelvic floor is the inside of the pelvic bowl and it creates stability on the underside of the pelvis. And it's just as important as all of the other muscles for supporting and stabilizing us. Fortunately, most of us have strong muscles on the rest of our body to compensate when there's deficits in this region. But it's really important that we really understand how to use the muscles properly for day-to-day -day life in terms of function. And the pelvic floor muscles um, create support to hold up our pelvic organs. And so when there's an underlying dysfunction in this realm, we can start to see pelvic organ prolapse or feeling kind of that vaginal heaviness that I was talking about earlier. Um, 
And so part of, this is a, a picture of part of what Lisa was talking about before with uh, the, the diaphragm being on top and the pelvic floor being on the bottom. And it's, it's a pressurized system in combination with the abdominal wall and the back muscle. So if you think about a soda can and it being pressurized, if you stomp on it or try to um, dent it, you know, nothing really happens. I mean, the, the can gets a little bit squished, but nothing happens in, in the grand theory. But if you crack the top a little bit and then you stomp on it, soda sprays out. And that's basically kind of the system of the, the, ab, the abdomen canister being pressurized. And so if you have a muscle anywhere in that system that's been compromised, you can have urinary leakage or fecal incontinence and have a, a compromise in the system. The interesting thing is a lot of people will be referred to physical therapy for pelvic floor, um, and they've been told to do Kegels. And we can do an exam and find, you know, their pelvic floor is having some trouble and their strength isn't quite there and they need to work on their coordination. But sometimes we'll go in and we find, you know what, the pelvic floor looks great, the strength is great, the endurance is great, the coordination is great. Why are they leaking? And then we'll look at the abdominal wall and go, oh, well, you have a huge separation in the abdominal wall from pregnancy or from some other stress over time, or maybe you've had a bunch of abdominal surgeries and you've got all these scars in your belly. Um, I saw a case a number of years ago that had tons of belly surgeries. And when I looked, her pelvic floor was actually fine. She had great strength, great coordination. She could do all these things. But every time she got up out of a chair, she was having some urinary leakage. And so we worked purely on her abdominal scars from all of her surgeries and worked on belly coordination and strengthening. And all of a sudden, her incontinence went away. So it had nothing to do with her pelvic floor directly. Her pelvic floor just couldn't maintain the pressure stabilization within the system because her belly was compromised. And so it's important for us to look at all these things and realize that incontinence isn't always pelvic floor, sometimes it's other things related. And then the other piece of the pelvic floor is that it has a sexual function. And so the muscles really contract and relax during sexual activity to provide normal sensation for individuals. And if there's some sort of dysfunction within those muscles, then people sometimes will have pain, they might have muscle spasms with orgasm, and then they'll abstain from sexual intercourse. And so working on pelvic floor muscle coordination and normalizing the control can really help to resolve these symptoms for people. And to you. Yep. Back to Lisa. So I'm going to chat with you guys about when somebody comes in to our office um, for an appointment, we spend a lot of time um, on the evaluation looking at the big picture, okay? We don't just go straight to the pelvic floor and examine that. We get a, a global idea of what's happening because there's so many factors that can um, influence what's happening with the pelvic floor, with your pelvic organs, with the abdominals. So we have you fill out a kind of a lengthy um, health history. Um, sometimes medications can cause urgency, frequency, such as blood pressure medications, um, diuretics, anti certain antidepressants. So we want to kind of identify what's happening due to, due to, due to that. Um, in the health history, we also look at um, you know, previous surgeries, previous pregnancies, is someone also dealing with chronic Crohn's or endometriosis? There's a whole gamut of things that people come in with. Um, and then once we get through all the paperwork, we look at your posture. Your posture has a huge influence on how those four muscles in that canister work. Um, so if your posture is not optimal, we will definitely work that into your treatment plan so that everything is aligned and biomechanically can work and function at its best, okay? Um, we look at pelvic floor strength, but we also look at the pelvis uh, because on the sides of that pelvic floor, there's some attachments to some internal hip muscles. So we always look at the hips and the low back. Um, but when we do an internal exam, we try to figure out, okay, is your strength 
you know, five is the strongest, zero is nothing. Where do you guys, where, where does the person fall on that scale? And can they, is there, um, does a person have 100% internal sensation, right? Sometimes when we have, when people have had uh, vaginal delivery, there's been sometimes a compromise on the nerves because the, the nerves can only stretch like nine to 11% before they start kind of losing some connection. So sometimes people will have diminished sensation, um, which can make doing the Kegels a little bit more difficult. Um, and then we look at tone. Is your pelvic floor relaxed? Or is it kind of in a tense state? You know, if someone comes in and their pain is one of their big things, sometimes, you know, a big, a big area of the body that most people carry tension in is their, their shoulders, or they clench their jaw, or they carry the tension in their low back. But sometimes that tension can build up in the pelvic floor, right? And so we look to see, is someone walking around like semi-clenched? And then if that's the case, the treatment plan is going to try to you know, relax everything. Um, so we talked about muscle length. Um, how does a person move? Um, are you on a teacher? Are you on your feet all day? Are you a nurse and you're hoisting patients, right? Because that's a lot of increased extra intra-abdominal pressure. Um, so there are different demands on all of us in our jobs and doing that day after day after day, weeks, months, years accumulate sometimes into some wear and tear. Um, and if your posture's off and you're either sitting slouched at your, at your desk or you're sitting or you're standing slouched, that can have some pretty powerful effects on the pelvic floor as the rest of your body, but also on the pelvic floor. Um, and then your habits. Um, what, what are your habits in the way you move? Um, like, like I said earlier, doing some, doing some things repetitively can have kind of a big impact on us. And then our diet, you know, our bladders do not like caffeine. Our bladders do not like, a, you know, a lot of acidity. So we look at your fluid intake. We look at your general fiber intake. Um, because if you're constipated and you're chronically straining and bearing down and pushing down, you're pushing that, that beautiful bowl. You're kind of like inverting it, right? You're like pushing it downward. So we don't want you to to bear, to bear down. Um, sometimes people will come in and they go, oh yeah, I'm hydrated. And we'll say, okay, like write everything down, bring it in. And they'll be like, oh my God, I'm only drinking 30 ounces of liquid a day and none of it's water. I, I always carry water. I thought I was drinking all this water. So that's, that can have a big impact um, on the system as well. So we look at other things, but in, in general, we, you know, we try to look at the big picture to identify all the little pieces to set people up for success in, you know, gaining, um, either overcoming their pain or gaining continence or whatever it is that they're there to see us. Um, I mentioned the posture. When someone is standing in neutral, that bowl is just where it ought to be. Okay, but if someone's standing kind of in a sway back, their pelvis is tipped back, their pelvic floor is tipped back. Same if you're standing with an arc, a little bit too much of an arch, that pelvic floor is now tipped forward, right? And so a lot of times we'll see runners who don't have the best posture and they go and they run and we fix their posture and then they go for their run and they, they're able to go for their full five miles without having to find a place to squat or without having to withhold water before they go you know, and run on an empty water. So that can have a huge impact. Our posture can have a huge impact on our mechanics with our, our pelvic organs. Um, same thing with the sitting and the slouching. Um, the, you know, there's different mechanics, without getting too detailed in each thing, there's different mechanics that we use when we walk, when we run. It's not just when you stand still and like, oh, do I have good posture? It's also the way you move and use your body. 
Um, okay, so during the exam, when we, when we test your pelvic floor strength, um, one of the main things that I would say that people do is they hold their breath when they try to Kegel. And it's because they're concentrating and it's because they're weak, so they're really trying to muster, muster up energy to do that. But that holding of the breath actually creates downward pressure onto the pelvic floor. We want that pelvic floor up and in. We don't want to be pushing down with holding our breath. So when Erica mentioned the coordination, this is one of the huge, huge things that we work on. And that's something that we get an idea of during the evaluation so that we can figure out how much time do we need to spend on this um, during treatment session. Um, and when Erica mentioned like, you know, this, I think it was like 63% of people do, who do Kegels with verbal instruction do them incorrectly. This is, this is one of the big reasons why. You good? Yeah, so I'm going to take this one here. Okay. Um, so another thing that we look at during our evaluation is how are people breathing? And why is that important? Well, a lot of us are breathing only up here, we're breathing in our upper and our middle lobes of our lungs. You know, we're kind of just shallow breathers. We don't take nice, deep diaphragmatic breaths all day long because a lot of us are living in a very fast paced schedule. And the other reason is because, especially women, we want to hold our bellies in, right? We're always trying to hold our bellies in to create that flat tummy. That's just, it, it, in, the, in the United States, that's the, that's the trend, okay? So people aren't doing these deep, nice diaphragmatic breaths into their belly throughout the day. The problem with that is, is that your diaphragm and your pelvic floor um, are best friends. They like to move together. So when you take a big, nice, deep breath, your diaphragm goes down and your pelvic floor moves a little bit down and you exhale and they go back up and they move together, okay? When you're not moving your breath like that, that pelvic floor can get very stiff and then it can't contract that well or it can't relax that well. So that feeds into the whole doing your Kegels incorrectly or that whole pain cycle. So we like to work on breath a lot in our practice because it just helps everything work together. Um, and we find that most people, when we say, breathe into your belly, take a breath, take a nice deep breath, and they'll go like this. <gasps> I'm like, you just moved your shoulders. Your belly didn't go out at all. So it's, it's we spent a lot of time on that. Um, am I, I'm still going, right? Yeah. So treatment, um, we keep going with the treatment once we've done the, the evaluation. One of the ways that we can help you guys strengthen your pelvic floor, access your pelvic floor, if you feel like you can't contract it on your own or you're getting such a small contraction but you're really not sure, um, biofeedback is a great tool. Um, we basically use a vaginal sensor and that sensor records information and puts it on a screen for us so that when you are lying there, we can see the normal activity at rest of your pelvic floor. If it's too high, we can practice breathing to get that, that pelvic floor to be at a better baseline. And then we can work on strengthening. You can squeeze up and in and then you'll see the line go up. And as, you, as your muscle fatigues, the line tends to drop down, right? And then you can try to make the line go back up by re-recruiting those muscles. This is such a great tool because when you get that visual input to a muscle that you can't see, everything clicks. And then you go home and you replicate those Kegels that you did in the clinic during the week until the next time you come in. And it just keeps elevating your, your strengthening process. Um, for some people, we use this to, um, for them to relearn how to coordinate relaxation 
with voiding or relaxation with having a bowel movement because when there's a lot of pain involved for years and years and years, you go to move your bowels or you go to sit down and urinate. Sometimes the opposite happens. Instead of your pelvic floor relaxing and letting the bladder and the bowel do its thing, there's a contraction that happens, a tensing. So sometimes we, do, we use this to unlearn that reaction and work through it and kind of retrain the muscles. Are you guys good so far? Questions? So another tool that we use um, using, we could use the same vaginal sensor is something called electrical stimulation. We use this for people who, for two reasons. One, their pelvic floor is just not able to make a contraction on its own. So we use the stimulation to deliver input to the muscles of the pelvic floor to contract, okay? This gets you on a, um, it's not forever, it's just until you can contract those muscles on your own, okay? The other reason we might use this is for someone who has overactive bladder. Someone who has overactive bladder constantly feels like they have to run to the bathroom, they're voiding very small amounts, they can't leave, go anywhere, or they can only do one errand at a time because they have to go back home to use the bathroom. The bladder is overactive. So we can put this stem on a different frequency to send inhibiting inhibitory messages um, that travel through a reflex loop um, via the pelvic floor and the bladder. Also very effective, okay? Um, and again, not forever, um, but you know, if someone comes in with overactive bladder and they don't have much of a pelvic floor, then they can't it's very difficult for them to squeeze their pelvic floor to make that urge go away and to defer that urge and calm that urge down until they can get to the toilet without leaking. So sometimes we use a combination of both the biofeedback and, and the stem, depending on what's going on with the person. Um, there's also, with the other thing that we have in our treatment option menu are um, vaginal weights. And these are, little tiny weights that are the size of a tampon. They come in a set and they range from 20 to 70 grams. And you, you're doing a super kegel with this, right? You're inserting it, you're standing up, you're holding that weight in um, until, you know, probably I usually do like 15, 20 minutes until you go to the next weight. This is not standard. This is usually for women who need to super strengthen their pelvic floor because they are marathon runners or they lift a lot of weights or they, they come to resilience and they're doing lots of jumping. Jumping is a very demanding activity, right? Because we land and all that intra-abdominal pressure goes downward. So we use this for people who really need, are interested in super strengthening their pelvic floor because their, do, their demands on their body are more than the average person. And then we do functional training. Um, we have a lot of moms who are lifting their babies and their toddlers and vacuum cleaners, and laundry, and groceries. They're lifting all day long. So, um, and, you know, also for exercise, squatting, things like that. But we teach people to coordinate squeezing their pelvic floor to brace against that pressure and then to also exhale with the exertion. So if you go to lift something, we don't want you to hold your breath. We want you to squeeze your pelvic floor and exhale, breathe out so you have support and you don't have that downward pressure of holding your breath. Because remember, now, you're, you know, now you've got a, something, a child or something else. Um, you know, there's a lot of Amazon drivers out there. I see a lot of women lifting the heavy boxes. So a lot of us are doing lifting on a regular basis. So we do, we go into the gym, we work on functional training tailored to what your needs are. Um, and then we do, for people who need it, um, people who have 
scar tissue or adhesions or internal tightness that needs to be massaged out or needs to be manually stretched or released or if there's trigger points that we need to deactivate. We will do hands-on manual therapy um, internally, externally, whatever is required to get to reset our tissue, to reset the tissues so they can function without pain. We also talk about behavioral modifications. Cutting back on coffee, if you know, we're switching to decaf, increasing your fiber intake. Um, we do a uh, ladder diary with people and oftentimes when we do that, people realize, a lot of people know they go to the bathroom all the time too much, but some people don't. So when we do the diary, people will go, well, I only went to the bathroom this time because I, I was going out or, and I just wanted to be sure, or, you know, things like that. So sometimes people are running to the bathroom too much. And over time, when that can do, that can kind of shrink our bladder capacity a bit. And then you've kind of created this like, oh, well now you can only hold 12 ounces instead of 16 or 20 ounces in the bladder, right? Because our body adapts. So. Sometimes we have to put people on a schedule or sometimes we have to say, okay, like try to not go to the bathroom um, if it's been less than an hour or whatever it is for that person. So we do behavioral modifications. We are not dietitians. We can refer out to nutritionists if we think that this is, a, if this piece is a big piece, we will refer out and we'll talk to you about it. We'll say, you know, this is a big part of what's happening here, but um, all right, questions? Not yet? You guys are good, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to touch a little bit about some of our pediatric uh, treatment because I, uh, a number of years ago, I was just treating adults and in, in speaking to a lot of moms and grandmothers um, and, and, and dads and grandfathers, I was hearing a lot of parents that were struggling with babies that were constipated or toddlers that were constantly having accidents or school-aged children that were having bedwetting trouble. Um, and the more I talked to these parents and grandparents, the, the more I, I felt their frustration. And so part of the banter back and forth was trying to understand, like, how do we, how do we change this? And, and also realizing that there's a large population of pelvic floor patients who are adults that have had a long-standing history with all of these signs and symptoms. And so the more we kind of answered back and forth, the more I started to realize if we can address this really early on, I think we can have a big impact. And it's interesting, so I we went through the training for pediatric pelvic floor, and in the coursework, we were told that we shouldn't really be treating kiddos until they're seven or eight. And I really feel like that's a disservice because I feel like there's a lot of parents that are struggling with babies who, who possibly are colicky, but like have a lot of gas pains and are really fussy or having difficulty with bowel movements or, um, or having like urinary tract infections because of the constipation. Um, and then I went through this as a, a mom early on with a kiddo and realized that there's something that we can do. And I was forever grateful for the training that I had and found that I could calm down my kiddo's stuff at the home Ten times faster just because of the tools that I had as a physical therapist. And I, I really feel like if we can pass on this information to parents and give them the tools to try to prevent this from becoming a more chronic issue, I think it's, it's really important. And so over the years, I've actually talked with um, parents over the phone and given them kind of like a bucket of things to work with and they ran with it and then called me back six months later and said, thank you so much. You know, you cured my kiddo's bedwetting. And I go, well, I didn't do it. You did it. But oftentimes there, there's simple changes and there's a you know, simple understanding. And so part of what we work on with kids is how they're sitting on the toilet, getting them to realize what their urges feel like. Sometimes it's putting them on a schedule to sit um, so that they're avoiding, being thoughtful about what they're eating and drinking and how often that's happening and creating a routine for that, um, creating um, uh, like sticker charts and that sort of thing to give some reinforcement for kids to feel 
um, successful and motivated to do things. And then sometimes it's just working on teaching them the breathing strategies that Lisa was talking about. Uh, I mean, we, we see it chronically in adults that don't know how to breathe properly, but we definitely see kiddos that are having funny breathing patterns or um, are holding their breath when they're trying to bear down for bowel movements instead of breathing properly. Um, it will be forever grateful to a mom that uh, gave me the tip that her son was going into the bathroom and moving like a cow when he had a bowel movement. And I thought, well, that totally makes sense. So if you move, you're pushing your belly out, you're still breathing and you're creating that downward pressure. Um, and I, for kids, it works. Adults tend not to want to move while they're going to the bathroom because it seems a little um, obnoxious. But um, it, it's been fascinating to me how many kiddos I can get to move on a regular basis in the bathroom. And because it's like a silly game, they follow through with it. Uh, we'll see where it goes into adulthood, but for now, um, we've got toddlers moving in the bathroom. Uh, so that is a wrap. Um, we are happy to take questions here. Um, yeah, if you want to text any questions or if you want to verbalize them to us, that is fine too. Whatever. Um, uh, oh, there it is. It'll show up right here. Okay. So guys, we just opened up the chat. So if you have specific questions about anything, you can, we'll get your messages on the chat. If you don't wanna to ask tonight, or if you think of something tomorrow, feel free to email us. Both are, are right. I don't think our email address yeah, is on, on the, the website. website. Um, but if you go on to the Platinum Physical Therapy website, there's an info email uh, address. Um, I believe it's info at platinumptma.com. But again, if you go on the website, it'll pull up uh, and the owner will send them directly to oh, us. You're welcome. Questions from Facebook no. at all? No? Okay. Um, so we're happy to answer questions uh, via email. If you have questions about whether physical therapy would be appropriate to you. It's, it's not uncommon for us to triage over the phone. So you're welcome to call our front desk and say, you know, I, I have some symptoms. I want to talk to one of the pelvic floor physical therapists and figure out, you know, whether it makes sense for me to come in or not. Um, and then also because of the lovely state that we're in with the coronavirus, uh, it's important to realize that we are accessible for telehealth visits. And so um, insurance is covering telehealth as well as in person still. So some people are comfortable in coming into the clinic at this point. Some people are doing a hybrid where they might come into the clinic one week and then do a telehealth visit the next. Uh, so whatever works for your world, if you need care, that is certainly an option. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you.